way over there. We didn't see you there. So, so, if you're standing here in the middle, you're sort of confident 50%, right? <laughs> If, and if we're standing more to the right, it's less than 50. Yes, that's right. right. Yes. You're 45. You're you 45. are 31 and a half. Uh, okay. I'm 39. <laughs> that way. For, I'm right now, just for hate speech. Just for hate speech. Just for hate speech right now. Oh, in that case, I'm over here. I just wait, 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 wait. That's a wrap then. It's 10.30, our session's over. Thank you for participating. Um, it was an experiment, um, but uh, we'll report this out without showing the pictures, of course. Um, yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Bonjour, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, we are here for the session blockchain, uh, on blockchain and uh, I have uh, an announcement to make. Uh, if you want to speak, you have to use the red button on the microphone and if uh, you turn it it will turn off the microphone and uh, you have to leave your phone far away from the microphone please for no interference okay uh, please wait just a few more minutes as we start our session Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, sorry about this last-minute delay. We, we almost ran out of speakers due to the limit of the of the room, but I, I gladly they are almost all here. My name is Claudio Lucena. I'm a professor at Paraíba State University and researcher at Foundation for Science and Technology. I'll be guiding you through this conversation together with my friend uh, Renata Quino Ribeiro. Uh, we have today in the panel, and the the, the structure is, is going to be the following. The, the panelists are going to bring a couple of, of examples and initiatives in, in which blockchain are being used for social and humanitarian good. The idea is to de deliver a couple of pitch presentations after which we're going to ask questions and start a uh, debate. We have here today with us uh, Professor Satish Babu, Valis, Valid al Sakaf, uh, hopefully Glenn McKnight is arriving, Monica Troches, uh, Olga Cavalli is not here yet, but Andrea Ramaoli Garcia. Uh, we're also expecting Katherine Garcia van Hoogstraten, 
and uh, uh, Sam Goldar. Catherine is online. Thank you very much. So, uh, if I think if we need a, a, a buzz expression to this, not that blockchain itself is, is not a buzz expression, but if we think uh, of a, a, a summary, uh, I, I would always uh, remind you of the word revolution in trust. This is one one technology that specifically allows us to outsource trust through the mediation of a technical communication or technical tools. And it, it, it seems that it's, uh, it, it's a very strong one in that sense. Now, the first wide-scale implementation was a rather controversial one because it started with currency. So that's the first one, and, and it did uh, raise a couple of, of concerns. Turns out it is not, the only, and it should not be the only application for this new technology, and the idea of this panel was to organize and showcase a couple of different implementations that concern social and humanitarian facts, and that's exactly what I have to, have to you today. I'll give the, the floor first to, to, uh, to Professor Satish Babu, who, are, who is going to address a couple of issues con concerning the flows in Karalia in India in August uh, 2018. And I'm going to re reach out for the other speakers that are coming. Professor Satish, please. Thank you very much. And uh, it's really sad to see that there's a big bunch of people waiting outside, unable to come in. Uh, unfortunate. So my name is Satish Babu. I come from India. And I'm going to speak about an initiative which is underway, uh, the use of blockchain in enhancing the trust and transparency of public donations after a disaster, natural disaster. So we recently had floods in Kerala, very widespread. A lot of people gave a lot of money, depending on how much they had, as contributions to the, the government, the official government site. Uh, I would estimate something like uh, maybe 50 to 60,000 people would have donated varying amounts. The amounts may, a few people have given very large amounts, and the, the distribution has a long tail with many people giving small amounts. And the problem in the government is that this money is given in good faith, but once it is given, the person who gave it doesn't seem to have any further rights on it. There's no information what happens to this money, where it is used, when it is used, uh, is there anything left? All this is left to the, the government's uh, kind of black box. Now, this is a, an important issue because people feel that the government should be accountable. They should be able to, you know, inform the people who gave in good faith what has happened to their money. But practically, there is a, a problem here. The problem is that the manageability of uh, these individual donations, which are of varying sizes, how does one give feedback to you know, each of these donors? So the blockchain actually comes in quite handy. And uh, I will be a little bit technical. Uh, so we are talking about the Ethereum platform. And uh, you might have all heard about the tokenization uh, standards, the ERC20, which is the generic token, uh, which is widely used as cryptocurrency also. Uh, there's another uh, lesser known token called uh, 721, which is a non-fungible token. Now, fungibility is a matter of uh, uh, certain things are fungible. For example, cash. If I borrow $100 from you, I can repay in 10 10s or 520s or whatever. That's equivalent. But if I borrow your car, I can't return another car. It's got to be the exact same car. Now, this is uh, actually fungibility. Now, Bitcoin is not really fungible because you can actually track where the coins go. We can, uh... Sorry for that. Um, yeah, so... There are also situations when you need to handle one-off things, say paintings or precious stones, which are not generative, which are not interchangeable. And if you want a token to handle those kind of things, you use a non-fungible NFT, non-fungible token. And that standard is ERC-721. Now, uh, if, you give a, if you give a donation to the government, you can actually write a smart contract that will give you back a non-fungible uh, token certificate that this is your metadata with your name, email ID, and all that, and how much the money was. The problem is that there are a large number of 50,000 such tokens. Now, how do you manage this and give feedback? 
Now, for this, we have a second type of token called a composable token. A composable token is a ERC-998, still a standard, not, uh, I mean, still a proposal, not a standard yet. What this 998 does is it, is, it provides for an assembly, a container token that can contain other tokens. Okay? Now, what we are proposing is that when you have a large number of donations, we are packaging it under a composable token in roughly equivalent amounts, say uh, 1 million uh, local currency. And for, to get this 1 million approximately, we are assembling a bunch of, the machine can do that. We can club together, uh, maybe, maybe it's about 1,000, 2,000 donations. You bunch it together, you get this 1 million rupees. Now that becomes one single token. So this is a, contain, uh, it's a composable token which contains other tokens. It can contain other 721 tokens itself, uh, or it can contain ERC-20 generic tokens. So what you have is a kind of assembly of tokens, which you can move in one shot. So then we have an admin interface, which actually only looks at these assembly tokens. And it can actually be forwarded to a department, and this whole thing goes as one. With all the 2,000 uh, sub-tokens inside them, it moves as one. And there you can actually use that money. Now, when you use that money, there is a property of a coin called burnability, or burning a coin. A burning a coin is actually uh, sending it to a special address, 0x000, uh, and that is basically destroying the token or consuming it. So burning refers to the act of actual use of the money. Now, in all these steps, it requires smart contracts, and the user who has given this original money gets a, uh, a message saying this is your, uh, when you first give it, you get a, a token saying this is what your token is, uh, the, uh, the 721 token with your name, metadata, and all that. Then you get a message saying that your token is packaged into a larger bundle, and that is this one with the address. And any of these addresses you can check on any public, you don't have to go through the government site. You can sidestep, and you can go directly to the blockchain, there are any, any number of uh, sites that you can go and check with an address, and you can see where it has gone. So there are still uh, uh, some metadata issues to be handled. For example, will each department where it is consumed or moved or returned, all this can happen in the course of the money uh, going up and down. So uh, it requires a little bit of uh, metadata that uh, if you go directly with, to the blockchain, you will see a bunch of uh, data that you can't read because the blockchain data field uh, is typically uh, encoded in binary, and if you try to read that, you may not be able to directly get that, but there are tools, of, uh, tools for viewing this in whatever format you want, like UTF-8. So what we're trying to do is to ensure that a donor knows what has happened to her money that, has, that she has actually donated uh, through these tokens, and she can look at the public blockchain and figure out where that money is, has it been has it been moved from one department or another? Has it been returned or has it been consumed? Now, this is not possible uh, without the composable token. That is a magic here because that's a magic sauce because that can move at one stroke a bunch of tokens together. So basically, uh, unfortunately, uh, the 998 is not yet a standard. And once it becomes a standard, it will be much easier. Now, for example, take a, a land deed. A land has got a house or a couple of houses there. Uh, assembly, a composable token can put both the houses as independent tokens into this bigger token. And then you can, you know, move it at, at one stroke. So that is the advantage of uh, the, the composable token. I will stop here and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Satish. Uh, um, once again, I'm, I apologize for, for the, the confusion here in the beginning. Clearly, the theme raises much more, and the size of the line that is outside shows us that the theme uh, raises much more attention than the, the room you were assigned here. Thanks for that, that, that uh, presentation, Professor. I would just follow up. I would propose that we leave these questions to after we, we wrap up with all the presentations, but I would just a, fo a quick follow-up. Which degree of implementation, if, if I missed it uh, when I was going out, which degree of, the, of implementation is the, your experience so far? Um, it has been, uh, it's not been implemented. It is, uh, we have basically the initial design in place. Okay. Uh, but this is government, and government mandate is required to kind of We'll go full swing. All right. Thank you very much. It's clear an implementation that can have other implications. Uh, we would go now to, to Walid. Walid has a, a very interesting experience in the domain of disinformation, right? Uh, Walid, can you uh, share it with us, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, am I coming clear? Yes. 
Um, uh, first time Walid al sakaf I'm uh, in using my academic hat as a senior lecturer at Sedetarian University in Stockholm. So at the university, I'm uh, co-authoring a paper, a uh, journal article, on uh, the use of blockchain in uh, news media, particularly in journalism, uh, because it's one of these areas that is uh, haunting a lot of us, disinformation and lack of uh, ability to prove provenance of uh, original content is uh, one of the major aspects that uh, blockchain might be considered as uh, a solution or participating and helping in a solution. My co-author, um, Malin uh, Pika Ed Edwardson and, and I uh, are uh, working on a paper to analyze one case study, uh, which is uh, civil. Um, if you may have heard of civil, civil is a US-based uh, project that's been actively developing a solution uh, that would result in what they call a uh, distributed newsroom. Distributed in the sense that the, there is really no central authority that would uh, be in, in, let's say, um, in charge of giving licenses, etc. And so the uh, notion of blockchain is built on the premise of dis decentralization. So it means that we need to eliminate the intermediary. And in many countries around the world, there is a very strong focus, or let's say power is concentrated in the hands of either the governments, in this case, and so uh, the government would issue the license, it can revoke the license, it can uh, penalize journalists, etc. And there is also um, a somewhat of a, a subtle influence in some countries, but and maybe more major influence in others, by uh, co corporations and, um, and advertising agencies, which actually can twist your arm as a journalist. They can influence you to writing in certain directions. And, and, vice, and, and so, so forth. So there are powers of center that are contributing to the problem of disinformation. And so uh, the idea behind it is what if it is possible to use the, what is called uh, the crypto economics of, uh, that are facilitated by the blockchain to reward and to penalize based, uh, I mean, journalists and the newsrooms based on the quality of their content. And so the premise here is to uh, establish a system in which a newsroom can be applied for. There would be a licensing mechanism, so you can apply for a license through the token of civil, which is uh, called civil. Civil tokens are uh, supposed to have been distributed through an ICO, which didn't go well, by the way. But nonetheless, the premise is that uh, it, once you have tokens and you have a worth of $1,000 of tokens, then you would apply for a license. And so once you apply for a license, you have a number of uh, metadata and, and details about what are you writing for and what is your uh, objective of, of this uh, newsroom. And once you have that ready and, and set, you uh, begin the registration process, which requires a voting mechanism by token holders of the community. So it means that the, the authority is no longer by, owned by one government, but it's owned by the holders of the civic, uh, civil tokens. And the, the idea here is that uh, the um, premise or the assumption is that good doers in the community are more than evil doers. So that's a very strong assumption. So the majority of tokens are in the hands of good people. So once they vote uh, for a newsroom, then it becomes uh, committed to the Constitution. And so the Constitution itself being monitored by the voters of the community, make sure that if you spread this information, if you violate the Constitution, if you begin, begin to be biased and contribute to damaging the reputation of the uh, whole system, then in that case you would actually be uh, voted against. Uh, and so you'd be reported and the report process means like some form of uh, protest saying that this newsroom has violated the Constitution, in which case it actually allows a vote against the newsroom by the community. And if the vote actually succeeds on 50 plus for percent, then the license would be revoked. So imagine like a situation where you have, let's say, 1,000 members. So you'd assess this based on the fa fact that these members are so committed to journalism that they will be able to act based on this. And if you actually end up voting for uh, the revoke of this uh, newsroom, then the fee that you had paid would actually be distributed 
to the person who started the protest, who started the reporting, 50% would be given to that person and 50% will be given, distributed to all the voters who supported this notion. So in this way you have um, an incentive to build upon always being on the right side of the vote, not being against the So this is in, in brief what we've been working on. Our paper is coming out hopefully early next year and we have just following this event the Prague Media uh, meeting, um, a meeting which will point meeting which will take place uh, in a few days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wally. That was a very interesting uh, topic and news. Uh, I, I have seen a couple of people taking notes, and it's certainly going to take some time of the discussion. You, you were describing something in the, in the more precise domain of disinformation, but it's clearly something that escalates to democratic participation as a whole, right? So I think this is going to be one of the, one of the possibilities for, of, of the debate. Next, uh, I have Glenn here, who is also are. Uh, I think uh, we don't have them here, Glenn, not the slides. Uh, Glenn is also, has also been working. Would you like to take this seat here? Glenn has also been working in the context of power, blockchain use for power grids, right, from Internet Society. And just coming from one, a couple of experiences in, in Thailand that's going to report to you. Can you take the seat, Glenn? I'm here. Uh, morning. Uh, the, you alluded to the one thing about the electrical grid. Um, it's not to, anything to do with ISOC. It's the stuff I do with IEEE. Back in uh, about five years ago, we had a challenge, the IEEE Foundation and the UN Foundation, and we were looking at the SDGs, and one of the three things we decided to focus on was reliable electricity. And at that time, we also had individual patient records. And I guess because of ignorance on our part, we weren't aware of the, the potential benefit of blockchain, whether for the electrical grid or patient records. And, and, um, but obviously, I think we're fully aware of it now. But um, I'm going to, uh, if you can pull up my slideshow. Oh, I don't think we have them. You don't have my slideshow? No. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess I'll improvise. Uh, let me just pull it up so I can see it myself, and I'm happy to share with everybody the uh, presentation uh, as well. Uh, just give me a second, and I will. Okay, this is great. Okay, not finding it. Okay, um, let me talk to you about the use of blockchain in two examples. The, uh, you alluded to the um, issue of blockchain in electrical grid. The, um, one of the best case examples I've seen is in um, Bangkok. There is an example of uh, people using the electrical grid uh, and being monitored in the ledger with a blockchain. But if you look at the potential of disseminated power, the, those that are not in the main grid. Uh, blockchain is an ideal technology and ledger for sharing uh, power. The second um, example that, uh, believe it or not, it was in Bangkok as well, and that's one thing Walid and I, who recently just came from blockchain, but from an ISOC board meeting, we wanted to meet both the people that were doing blockchain for the power grid, unfortunately because we were there only two days in Olga as well. We didn't get a chance to meet them, but the second group uh, in reference to the, uh, using technology for humanity was a group that was doing uh, blockchain for the um, unbanked. And in that case, they were working on, and they're still not in full implementation mode, but the idea was to provide, uh, using blockchain, the ability for those who are not, uh, uh, they don't, don't have uh, bank accounts that are not connected. So uh, what I'll do is, because I don't have my, my presentation in front of me and you can't see it, it's sort of pointless, but what I'll do is I'll make sure I, I'll share it with you. So I'm just going to pass it back to you.
thanks, Glenn. Olga. Olga has brought some updates from our region. Would you take the floor, please? Thank you very much, Claudio, for the invitation. Sorry, I was outside and I couldn't. I was waving in the door to, to get in, but finally I made it. Uh, I would like to share with you some uh, information from my region, in which I live in Argentina. And um, it has, it, as you may know, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging region because it's the region that has the, the highest disparity in between the good infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure, the wealth distribution. So that is extremely challenging. You find, for example, in one city, areas which are extremely developed and well-connected and areas which are totally out of, of uh, everything, out of internet access and other um, public services. So it's a big area, 22 million of square kilometers with um, more than 600 million inhabitants. But only 200 million have access to bank services, which is very low. Apart from that, a big portion of those 200 million people that do have access to bank uh, services, they only use them for perhaps receiving money from the government once or twice a month and using that for buying things at the supermarket or buying uh, food. So they are not uh, highly involved in a, in a banking system. So that promotes informal economy, um, market which are not formally legalized. Um, they don't, many people involved in those uh, informal economies don't pay taxes. The, the fact that they don't pay taxes, it's a problem for the government in not receiving the money to improve roads, hospitals, education. You know how, how this uh, circulates all over the, the society. So. Um, I would like to share with you some activities that have been happening in the region. Um, I would like to say that all these things related with technology are mm, unfortunately in developing economies, especially in Latin America, not in the high place in the priorities of the government because there is always some urgency to solve. You have poverty, you have hunger, you have strikes, you have uh, inflation. So that, that are the ones that government have to solve and they have to focus. And then when some projects related with technology, we were talking half an hour before about smart cities, it's the same problem. Uh, it could benefit the life of citizens, but there are urgent things to solve. So that's, that's a real challenge in Latin America. But I would like to point one project, which I think it's interesting, that it's a public project, move public, sorry, public private um, initiative partners, thank you, partnership, that it's led by the government of Argentina in the, in the name of the national CCTL, CCTLD.AR, which is our national uh, CCTLD, and uh, th that it's managed by, by the presidency, the National Chamber of ISPs, and the university network. So they have uh, they are building, it's in process, they, are, they had started last year, a uh, federal blockchain for Argentina, which I think it's interesting. It is not linked in any way to a cryptocurrency. What they want to build is a multi-service platform based on blockchain technology. So the idea is um, profit from the blockchain features of interoperability, collaborative use, and it expects to be used to run vertical applications and systems to enhance the organizational process, adding efficiency and transparency, and both for the public sector and the private organizations. Uh, it will be based on a light blockchain model with low cost and low energy use. For the moment, they are building uh, 15 uh, distributed servers and they are developing a platform under which applications will run. So I think it's, it's interesting. I, I would like to see how they will use it and how they will implement projects in it, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting way of showing the, the multi-stakeholder approach to, to problems that may benefit the, the national economy and, of course, bring more transparency and, um, and a platform that may allow new applications. Um, as I said, it has no associated cryptocurrency, but at the same time, 
in the region, there are other things that are important to, to mention. Maybe there are other colleagues from, from other countries that can uh, add uh, information about that. Uh, Mexico has recently issued a fintech, fintech, you say in English, fintech law. Uh, so that is, I think it's, it's an important issue when, when a country like Mexico or Brazil do issue laws or regulations in the region that has an impact in other countries, especially when Brazil does something, it has an impact, direct impact in Argentina. It, I don't know if it's the same the backwards, but, um, but uh, countries in the region are very, very much linked in between. So this, this law in, in Mexico may have an impact, as it's the first one in, in our Latin American region, and it will have an impact on crowdfunding and online pay payment and cryptocurrencies. Um, there, is, uh, there are cryptocurrencies uh, initiatives in, in Costa Rica, which is called Pura, AgroCoin in Mexico, which is mainly focused in agriculture. You know, the main, the main source of income for Latin American countries is agriculture, and, and small and medium enterprises working in, ag in agriculture. And also there's another project called Gemera in Colombia. So uh, it's moving perhaps not at the pace that other regions are, are doing that, but there are some initiatives that hopefully will impact positively in the lives of our people. Thank you. Thanks, Olga, for that very thorough update. One quick follow-up about the federal initiative and the federal structure you mentioned. Do you already discuss as a government which kind of service would you offer as, as a first prototype in the platform, or is that no such conversation? Uh, honestly, I, I have heard the announcement. I know them very well. I know the people from CCTLD and the people from the chamber. I think it's an initiative, uh, and it's an implementing phase for the moment. So I haven't heard yet um, if, if there are concrete examples of vert they, they want to do vertical um, projects for different industries. So we have to see how it evolves. Uh, what, what I like from it is the fact that it's public-private. I think it's a good thing. Um, and that the universities are involved. So the universities in Argentina have a very strong and very good uh, up-to-date technology from the technology perspective network. Um, and so they may bring them uh, a good base of information and knowledge. We'll see. Thank you very much, Olga. Next, uh, do we have Andrea ready? Andrea Romaoli Garcia, who's coming from under the United Nations and Internet Society hat, which is going to bring us a couple of perspectives on a, on a uh, partnership between an NGO and civil society in Zimbabwe from an African startup. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Please, Andrea, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, um, I will talk about uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and digital economy, but I will talk about importance uh, of taxes on this, because I have no doubt that interactions between human and machine means the future of the work. Uh, advances in artificial intelligence and robotics and uh, learn machine, how uh, change how we work and uh, jobs that we are view as safe are increasingly being automated, increasing migration, forced displacement. But um, I, I begin from three premises. Uh, developing the economy and creating jobs, it's a global emergency. We should be done this now and fast. At uh, two point, uh, we forget that the primary function of the state is uh, public interest. Uh, the profit is secondary. The double taxation is three point. The double taxation can be admitted because it represents this uh, illegal confiscation tax basis. And these three premises uh, allow us to think about uh, the double taxation, high taxes, and the state is sick for profit uh, from taxes prevent the positive advance and of global economy flow and the technological innovation. Um, also, is this opinion of big companies too, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Spot, uh, Spotify, and others. And why the European Union is thinking about create uh, different uh, taxes to digital economy? They already recognize that we will 
these miseries will prevent uh, the technological innovation. Uh, for this reason, in October, uh, the spokesman uh, in European Union in the executive commission defended the proposal about to create a living playing field to companies in digital economy, whether are based in or outside the European Union. Uh, governments uh, need a tax to administration uh, state activities. It's it's clear, but they cannot. Uh, they cannot uh, increase or create a new tax every time they are need money. Uh, this is a lazy way, and uh, the governance formula to administrate states is old, doesn't work, and is, is jeopardizes the survival of humanity. Uh, it should be create our strategies to maximize the application of taxes and through a uh, participative uh, animal budget plan uh, focused in urgent and fundamental necessities. It is democracy. It's a uh, 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 materialization of democracy. Uh, I made a research uh, three years ago and finished now this year, and the result from my research uh, shows that the technology uh, especially artificial intelligence, uh, cryptocurrency, and blockchain uh, is raising the dimension of human rights from five to sixth dimension. Uh, there is social and uh, historical and mathematical reports from the United Nations and other agencies showing this as uh, evidence. And uh, considering uh, technology in the sixth dimension of human rights is important because it will uh, allow governments to maximize application uh, of taxes. And uh, it will add in the technology in a focal point to receive investments. And we need this now. Uh, by, the way, invest, uh, by the way, investments in technology is one of the goals in 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and because it will reduce hunger and, po and poverty um, faster. Indeed, uh, the digital economy is setting new professional positions in the virtual environment, and you need this so much. We need this urgently because the population is growing fast with uh, roughly 83 million people be adding every year. And by um, also uh, the economy with blockchain and cryptocurrencies requires investments in laws to create uh, the trust and avoid laundry money and avoid fraud. Uh, these companies uh, need uh, helping us. If a company doesn't create uh, new jobs, or if this company is establishing um, conditions similar to uh, labor slavery, uh, this company must be expelled from the digital economy uh, because they have no social function. But to make this, we need laws. We, did, we need the uh, investments in laws. And uh, from my studies, uh, I saw that Mr. Muscat from Malta Island is working in the same vibe I am talking here. Italy is needed this too. And in Malta, they are making investments in framework uh, regulatory uh, to avoid fraud, laundry money, and high taxes too. Uh, to create an uh, uh, environment to help uh, economy and a sustainable world. Uh, but by technologies can help just a little, or technology will be useless if rulers don't accept it. Because 
I saw that partnerships between civil society, um, uh, private sector, and governments, non-governmental organizations is a, a, are a faster way to allow access to education in developed countries. Thus, uh, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain technology, I think that isn't a threat to humanity. Uh, indeed, this brings a better and uh, more uh, dignified for our life than we should change uh, the way our children and adolescents is getting education because we can't uh, compete with machine. I think that the, uh, everything will be better if you are change education and our children and adolescents is getting capacities to communication, partnerships and manage conflicts um, and make uh, solutions suitable. We should prepare children to acquire principles and ethics. It is important in technology in, with blockchain, cryptocurrency, and digital economy because we are leading with money from other peoples. Um, for the reason I am talking here, I established in Zimbabwe uh, as an example about everything I, I said uh, to now. Uh, I established a um, blockchain for good uh, program, uh, Save the Child, Childhood. It's a, a model from United Nations, Blockchain for Goods, but I made some uh, modifications. My model is a, a startup, an educational startup, and multi-sectorial. At the same time, we are improving the nations and improving the programs in Simuka Africa Youth Association. And we are education people to acquire educa technological education. And other example about this, it's very clear, it's success totally. Uh, I am working in a company, Relax, that is making partner private company, uh, profitable company, but making partnerships with developing countries, universities to establish programs and uh, improve research and um, so and finally I think that this together will make our territorial borders very safe because it, uh, if people is feeling security no one will want to go out from your country getting other country because our territorial borders now is virtual, not just uh, physical. So uh, it, it was just a, a, a brief and uh, yeah, I was talking very fast because I want to talk a, a lot about this. But I think it, uh, blockchain is much more a software, is much more than a tokenization. Uh, blockchain technology and digital economy and artificial intelligence, it is human rights, a real human rights in six dimensions, not, not fifty, because fifty is just talk, uh, think about peace. And now we are thinking about peace and a sustainable world. It's different. It's urgently. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very, thank you very much today for this uh, rights-based approach and uh, I'm sure you have a couple of more minutes to talk about and discuss a bit more concrete about the experiences. That was a very co good connecting line about the private partnerships and how they could foster uh, social good because that's, that's what Monica is going to talk about in a couple of minutes. But now we do have our friend Katarin Garcia van Hoogstraten, uh, a fellow lecturer from the Hague Academy of Applied Sciences. She couldn't make it here to, to Paris, but I guess she is online and available for a discussion now. Catherine is developing, uh, among other works, uh, this one on identifying and uh, uh, identifying vit victims for trafficking uh, under the, uh, the UN framework. Catherine, can you, can you hear us? Hi. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Perfect. Well, always um, 
a great pleasure to join, uh, in this case, from The Hague, but very soon in Paris, um, my colleagues organizing this amazing workshop on blockchain uh, for social and humanitarian issues. Um, when I thought about the joining this workshop, I, I couldn't avoid to think about trafficking in persons and, of course, smuggling. And so I think with this short conversation, I'm trying to hit two of the main goals of this workshop. One is about the uh, examples, concrete examples about synergies that have been developed. In this case, I'm going to talk about some of the UN organizations um, and agencies um, tackling this social uh, and, of course, humanitarian issue as it is uh, trafficking in persons and smuggling. And secondly, um, also hitting the goal of identifying how, uh, in this case, TIP, the trafficking in persons and smuggling, may be mitigated my, uh, through the development of blockchain technology. So, but let's start with definitions, because the most I speak about trafficking in persons, and I always notice some kind of um, a lack of clarity about the difference between TIP, as we call it, trafficking in persons and smuggling. And so it's, it's very important to touch upon definitions before developing the technology. So there are two different um, categories, however, they are interrelated, TIP, trafficking in persons and smuggling. Smuggling is a crime involving the procurement for financial or other material benefit for illegal crossing of borders. Ends when migrants arrival at their destination. However, trafficking, the criminal act lies in the act of exploitation within the aim of exploitation of labor, for instance, to generate illicit profits for, of course, the traffickers. So there are few reasons um, uncovered for why human traffickers are able to smuggle people. Political instability, vulnerable migrants uh, fleeing the country can be some of the reasons. Weaken at borders can be other reasons, but most importantly, the lack of identification credentials is arising as one of the most important and emerging issues of this uh, humanitarian and social crisis around trafficking in person and smuggling. As you have seen from the definitions, they are interconnected. One leads to the other. Smuggling leads to trafficking in persons in most of the cases. There are a lot of overlaps, therefore. But it's important to, um, to understand these definitions and how, um, uh, before developing technology, we can tackle um, some mitigation for this um, uh, problem of trafficking in persons and smuggling. Some facts and figures. Uh, human traffickers offer to create fake identities. This is the main issue, social issue that arise. In order, of course, to move migrants to pass from a port at their destination country. So, for instance, 20 million children in the sub-Saharan uh, Africa do not have a birth certificate. And 50% of persons in the region, in the Saharan uh, Africa region, do not have a proof of their own identities. Another example, every year, hundreds of women, of girls, as young as 13 years old, are trafficked from Moldova to Russia, Turkey, and United Arab. Um, and other nations, of course, mainly to work as a sex slaves. So, having a touch, a touch upon um, some facts and figures and definitions, let's see some ongoing projects. And here is where uh, UN, I think, comes in a very important part of the definition of the uh, of the uh, tackling of the problem, the project of the problem. Um, UN system organizations are using at the moment semi-private blockchain protocols. For instance. As a first example, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, have developed a identity management system uh, by which they're issuing international and universal identification credentials, aiming at different specific targets, but most importantly, providing secure identification. Also, um, it's important to highlight about this specific project uh, they move ahead in 2017, so it's literally uh, very, very new, with a centralized system and prototype blockchain di digital ID network. Accenture and Microsoft have been key partners in this partnership, and um, they're, of course, subject to assign and neutral party auditors to mitigate privacy risk. 
Another example that I bring to the table, uh, to your attention, is the UN Office uh, for Project Service, UNOPS, and I see my colleague uh, from the UNOPS there in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the attendance, in online attendance, uh, Mr. Yusuki Yamagimoto. Um, and the War Identity Network have in, been quite involved in the development of log change-based universal ID to slow, uh, in this case, child trafficking. So this is based on mapping identities through family tree and require other family members to digitally sign an event on the blockchain and is aiming to allow for universal credentials verification. It's still, um, of course, in a, a preliminary stage of the project. So some conclusions that could Uh, draw that could, we could draw around this um, uh, use of um, a blockchain for uh, identification in cases of trafficking in persons and smuggling are obviously governments in many emerging markets are simply unable to track all, to track all their uh, citizens through the uh, centralized database or registry of identity, especially in countries suffering uh, conflict or after, aftermath of the conflict. So blockchain self-sovereign identities can directly empower high-risk populations targeted to human trafficking to hold and manage their own identities. And that's the main um, goal, I think, around this, is empowering agency as well, of course, and making it easier for them to cross borders themselves without dependence of false promises coming from traffickers. A third conclusion I will make around this is that universal identifications of high-risk populations, in this case, as I spoke about trafficking in persons and smuggling, involves uh, the problem of source, material and technological access. Uh, with a blockchain-powered identity, uh, any migrant with internet access could create an identity and have that recorded on a mutable ledger. Ideally, they could use their phone and digital identification to verify at ports and destinations. And alternatively, in countries where internet adoption is extremely low, for instance, via um, SMS, they can send to record or call for information on the blockchain. So those are some of the um, potential conclusions um, uh, drawing from this um, short presentation. Thank you very much, and of course, I'm available at any time, and also um, at my Twitter account and email um, uh, for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your valuable presentation. I, I think I'm not sure you can you can stay with us a little bit more for for the next minutes of discussion, but I think this is one application that's going to raise it also uh, uh, some interest here. Uh, I don't see Sam in, in the list. If you are there uh, and could send us a a text or whatever a smoke sign to so that, uh, that we know that you're around but even if, if Sam is not there we'll still have a wrap-up here with our friend Monica who's also helping to organize the session and to put up with this uh, other themes and Monica is giving you an overview there is a thriving scenario for startups at blockchain with evident and legitimate uh, profitable interests but Monica is trying to give is gonna bring us an idea of how to drive this interest also into an NGO perspective and for the third sector right Monica thank you very much for your um, effort and you have the floor thank you Claudio my name is Monica Troches I am system engineering and work in software development in this short intervention I want to share information about business models and new fundraising vehicles derived from blockchains. The Endeavor organization did a research on emerging economics, specifically in Latin America, where the impact of this economic could be very significant. This research includes a mapping of the entrepreneurship that developed the technology of blockchain as a business model. Within this mapping, they detect in Latin America more than 100 companies with these characteristics. One of the main discoveries of the analysis is that it is in a stage of development, is which innovation and disruption are characteristics of companies. Another interesting discovery in this study is the high access to capital, as well as the access to new lifting vehicles such as 
initial coin offerings. Of the companies that raised capital, 27 did so through an ICO, following by angel investors and capital seed with 23 each, then friends and family with 20, while 26 did it through institutional funds. For many years, one of the main ways in which companies raised capital was through the initial public offers, where they offered their, their shares to the public for the first time. Afterwards, the organization began to finance themselves through crowdfunding, a method to raise money with the collective efforts of other people. Whenever in an effort to reduce the costs associated with going public, some startups begin to convince people around the world, not necessarily accredited or, or experienced investors, to buy rise to their rise project called tokens. This form or financial is known as the initial coin offer. There are three types of tokens. Security tokens, it gives their owners the property rights of a company, like any other asset. This token issued by the company increases in value over time. Utility token, be creating token, an organization can sell digital coupons for the service or products that is be, being developed, which will be available at the maker even in months. And crypto token, miners who lend themselves to blockchain transactions are paid with, the, with this token. The ECO obliges to rethink the traditional way of obtaining resources for charitable organizations. It still has many roots but it's a methodology with interesting qualities because it facilitates access to capital. The slogan of blockchains are decentralization and distribution. I'm going to talk to you a little about a business model that can be considered for the charity, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, DEO. Essentially, DEO allow people to exchange their funds with anyone in the world. This can be one in the form of an investment, a charitable donation, the collection of money, loans, and so on, all without an intermediary. Those represent a paradigm, paradigm we shift in the very idea of economic organization. If others complete transparency, total shareholder control, unpredecent flexibility and autonomous governance. The charity sector is losing opportunities to raise money and attract donors due to lack of knowledge about blockchain. The leaders of the sector must join to how develop the technological solutions to learn about the benefits that this toll can bring them. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again for the effort in putting this discussion together and, and for offering now a path for the rest of the discussion. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure that we have Sam on, on the line, so if we don't, that leaves us with about half an hour for the interventions and discussions. So if anyone uh, wants to... Renata, please. Thank you very much. Hi, I am Renata Kino Ribeiro. I am a civil society MAG member, and I'm also a member of the Internet Society Blockchain Special Interest Group. First of all, I want to thank everyone who joined us online or on site or on door <laughs> waiting to join us because uh, we have a room at full capacity. And there is still an overflow room outside of people watching us. And, uh, and uh, we are very grateful. Um, I would like to say that uh, we have another lightning session at 2.20 uh, on Sal1, uh, the Isaac blockchain team. And uh, the human rights main session on 4.30, it will be an open town hall. So it's on the big room, the room for the main sessions. Uh, 
hundreds of seats and everyone can uh, speak. We will, we will have a chair on the stage for people who want to go to the stage and speak. But most of all, uh, we have an, a, a strong online presence, uh, Isaac Blockchain, and we participated in several hackathons on blockchain for good. So you can also find projects that are online and that can complement on what the speakers have brought. Thank you, Renata, for this heads up on the uh, interest group and uh, thanks the group also for the amazing work it's been done and the initiatives it's been carrying. Uh, if any of the speakers would like to de develop and expand a little bit on, on, their, on their experiences, Walid, please. Yeah, um, it's Walid uh, Al-Sakaf again. I, I actually, when I described the um, crypto economics model of civic, uh, I didn't, uh, I had to cut short because this model is still uh, very much uh, in progress and, and one aspect of it was the very key question, what if the, uh, the groups or let's say the token holders turn out to be evil? And that's one uh, idea behind the 51 attack that haunts a lot of blockchains. And what is interesting here is in, in our research we realized that maybe blockchain is not necessarily the best model for some areas. I'm not saying journalism might be one of them, but I'm putting out a critical question and that would be open because if we were to be totally democratic, what if the majority ends up working in a direction against the professional ethics of the constitution of civic? And if it's a majority pushing for one direction, what if that direction is built on the same interest that we try to escape? commercial interests, political interests, if it's hijacked. So that's where uh, we've uh, developed this and we, uh, in Civic, they have this uh, uh, upper house, uh, similar to the Supreme Court appeal process, where even if you did win a vote and the vote was in a direction that's against the Constitution, there is what is called the council. The Civic Council ends up uh, being petitioned, let's say, appealed to the council. And the council is a, actually people like me and you, so they're not uh, smart contracts. And there they begin to look into the uh, voting process, and if it turns out to be against the interest of the uh, in system, then it can downvote uh, it or reject the vote results, in which case there is another appeal process <laughs> to, by the voters, and in which case uh, if they end up having a super majority, which is three, uh, two-thirds of the whole base, they end up even uh, overcoming the power of the council. So that's where the crypto economics model is playing out. The interesting thing is that in our research we saw this is very risky. If you consider the fact that tokens will be traded over time, they will change hands. What if the scenario would end up being, let's say, 90% in the hands of a certain group? That may end up doing a lot of effort, in which case the the civil, and I did interviews with civil, and they said, this is a risk we are willing to take. Journalism cannot afford to wait. And so we'll see how it plays out, and it's an interesting right. Yeah, anyone else? It is definitely interesting, Walid, because it's hard to keep track of all the initiatives in this area, right? So I guess everyone here has the same, has the same problem. I do know of other couple of initiatives, like Schmidt, Mid Nation, or Democracy Earth, that implement democracy representative democracy or direct democracy models, but I, it's the first, it's really the first time I see one that you implement to curate content, because that's pretty much what, what you're bringing here, right? A content and analysis through a blockchain tool. But it's, it's, it's definitely very interesting. Anyone else that could, uh, Professor Satish. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Satish, for the record. Um, I would also like to briefly mention an, another initiative again in the transparency uh, kind of a mode. Uh, one of the uh, things that everybody uses is a double entry bookkeeping model. Uh, every organization uses a double entry. But we have had uh, catastrophic failures of uh, the system. Uh, and we have a large number of examples. And people have been uh, kind of asking this question, how do we make the accounting system more transparent? At least for those organizations like NGOs, or government organizations, not-for-profits, who want to be transparent. Currently, there is no way that, uh, you know, the double entry system can be opened up just to public like that because it is normally within the four walls of an organization. Uh, it is it's entirely private. And, of course, many commercial organizations do not want to open up. That is fine. 
but at least those organizations that want to open up the, the new model called the triple entry uh, bookkeeping uh, tries to take a copy of every transaction at the level of the building blocks, it's the vouchers and receipts, and it takes it to the uh, blockchain. Uh, you need an intermediary storage, so IPFS is one you know, possibility of storing this uh, data, but the hash of these things go on the blockchain. And the address from where this has been posted, which is the organization's own address, is given to the, its internal stakeholders, which could be board members, it could be a much broader uh, stakeholder community. And this enables them to, they talk about the, the double entry bookkeeping as dancing under strobe lights. What it means is basically that you, you have one posture and one second later you have a totally different posture. You do not know how you got there from here, because the strobe light works for that. And this is how organizations put out their uh, you know, summary statements of account, that you don't know how this has happened, but now they were there and now they're here, and the, the path is unknown. But the moment you have a triple entry kind of a system whereby you open this up, the trajectory becomes much more clear, and anybody who's monitoring, even a member of the general public, can now figure out what is really happening. So this, uh, again, uh, this has been about half done, and we are continuing with it. Uh, and uh, again, it's not for all organizations, but those that want to be explicitly transparent can think of using such a system. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who want to share a government or a, a, a private or a startup initiative, another use, or any questions to, to speakers? Please. I think it's a comment and some questions, if possible. Uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, Veronica from uh, Romania. I coordinate the think tank uh, concerning digital policies, and we work a lot with entrepreneurs because uh, it's a very active ecosystem over there. And uh, the two questions that usually appear among entrepreneurs is, one, is it really cost effective to invest in blockchains compared to other existing technologies? And I think for the two examples, concrete ones we have here, it's worth asking this as well. Is there really not another technology that is already available and then also whatever we know about blockchain it's very much a lot of theory and principles actually but in practice we already should know that blockchain technologies are not all open and 100% decentralized and powered to the people and especially the news application and the use case I understood it's very much controlled and mon monitored or mo I know, mo moderated let's say in a way so that entails even more uh, ethical implications that we should be concerned because you were mentioning some sort of constitution so it's even the question who is creating it who is contributing and changing it afterwards who is saying who has access to the pl platform and not it was online right please thank you um, my name is Jean-Christophe Finidori, for the record. Um, I was until very recently working for a UN agency. I uh, just vacated my position to join a startup, we can say that, um, working on um, these topics that you just mentioned. Uh, very briefly, my area of expertise is on blockchain naming systems. This is not the topic today, but just to let you know that there is so many diverse areas that the blockchain can applied on. Um, the startup I just joined called Delife, Delife.io, and uh, we are putting on the market uh, a blockchain-based securing decision-making process to help uh, the marginalized community, marginalized populations, especially the indigenous uh, populations, and especially in the context of extracting industries, to be, to, to, to let them know and to give them some tools um, to rate the, their concerns with the voting system mechanism uh, as some of uh, you already mentioned before secured by blockchain. Uh, just one or two observations from what I've heard uh, this morning today, so thank you for all the, the speakers and panelists. And to follow up on your observation, um, I attended a, a conference a couple of weeks ago here in Paris about blockchain, and someone asked, uh, do you see any other alternative uh, instead of blockchain? And the speaker said, you know, if a simple centralized database can address your issue or your needs, do that. You don't need a decentralized system, very complex. The other point I would like to mention, and we, are, we already 
heard about that, and sometimes it's not clear for people when, when we mention when we're talking about blockchain system, if the possibility to to reward and to incentivize some people to be involved in the process. We had the, the voting mechanism, and uh, this is something that we try to explore: how to to give some people, especially the most marginalized people, to get access to a new form uh, of revenue. Um, so this is something that we try to, to explore more actively. Thank you. Thank you very much for the valuable interventions. If you allow me to abuse my position as a moderator, I'll try to summarize the question in, in such a way. I know this is something, I don't know if it... Oh, please. Thank you. Um, well, Willie. Um, <laughs> Sorry for, for being late. Um, my name is Pinder Wong. I'm the ch uh, chair of the Internet Society's Blockchain Special Interest Group. Just to riff off uh, of that point, and again, thank you um, to, to everyone for, for organizing this. Is th this is a lot of, um, there's a lot of enthusiasm in this space, which is really wonderful. Um, maybe, well, let's just leave it at that. But let's, let's sort of try and clarify um, two contributions. First of all, I, I use this as a visual aid. Uh, why? Because um, these are ultimately cryptographic technologies, right? So whoever has, you know, the, the, the lock, if they don't have the combination, it's kind of useless. And so I like to say in this space that no one is above the law, but no nation is below mathematics. And what I mean by this is that, especially for people who are marginalized, who don't have access to legal identity under the rule of law, be it migrants or uh, forced refugees or just um, um, people who have uh, a temporary ne expats like myself. I'm a netizen expatriate. I travel the world with a bag and a smartphone, right? But I have a legal identity and many people don't. Whereas now what we do have, or we have the possibility for the very first time to have mathematics or a cryptographic identity as being outside of legal systems per se, but actually a different route of, of soundness and trust and legitimacy. In other words, that the, if you, again, if you have the combination, you own the asset. So it's great that there's a lot of enthusiasm about using ICOs and security tokens, and utility tokens, etc. But I think we're quite a far ahead of where the technology actually is. And so my own involvement with scaling Bitcoin, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin protocol, there's a meetup tomorrow evening in Paris, is that these protocols are really hard and they're really slow to scale. So the technical issues which remain, I mean, you know, remain to be solved, and I think they will be solved, but let's not try and get ahead of ourselves. Why? Because if, if you do have the combination through, you know, quantum cryptography or cryptographic break, then many things can become unwound. And so I am very cautious of two areas in particular. One, which is identity on a blockchain, and I am involved in that space, Verus One is an example, because when it, unra when it unravels, again, it may do so very ungracefully. Second one I, I, I'm, I hear a lot, but I'm very fearful of, is basically land rights. You know, registering land rights on, on, on treating uh, sort of land title in a blockchain. And the reason why I'm concerned is this. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin are fine because all that you need to know is internally consistent within the software itself. Right? 21 million Bitcoin, that's it. And so Bitcoin is a great example. It's, it's a 10-year-old tech. But the minute you have to touch something outside, so-called in the real world, like where is the container for logistics, then what happens if we have fake data, right? Or the data in itself is incorrect. Then you've got a ledger with inc inc incorrect data forever. It's transparent, but the transparency might not help you. It's immutable, but the data is wrong. So what then? So I think there's a great opportunity for this group to, again, think very thoughtfully, not so much about the technical details, they're important, but to think about the qualities of transparency or, you know, radical transparency, thinking about the real-time accounting and auditing, which is what the technology enables, and ultimately these new forms of accountability and governance, because what I think the technology might actually be, and accounting is, a, is, is, a, is an example, but so is law, because now there's smart contracts like openlaw.io that tried to simulate the law online with these smart contracts is that I'm not quite sure but this ultimately may be a governance technology. So that's why the Internet Governance Forum, this conversation is very important. I think we're beginning to know what are the properties of these systems that as currently they exist, but not necessarily as at how, we sh how they should be. 
And that takes a much broader audience than just the technologists to define if these are going to be platforms on which society is going to be built. Thank you. That, those comments could very well start. Out of those comments, a couple of more days of discussion could stem definitely. Uh, but still, coming back to the, to, the, to the question that was posed, I would like to see if I could summarize this. I don't know if Catherine, in terms of implementation, or Walid are, are in a position to that. Professor, Professor Sadish Babu is in a position to do that because the question was like, and if I understood it right, not only if it is economically feasible, but if it's a, from a computational perspective, how much more work does it take to implement a solution in a structure like this than in, in, in natural uh, or, or in other ordinary means, is it? Professor, could you help us? Sure. So, uh, first of all, uh, the blockchain is not a solution for all uh, issues that we have. There is a very limited uh, set of uh, situations that you can use the blockchain. Uh, even when you, uh, even from a very basic business kind of sense, sometimes it doesn't make uh, much uh, sense to use a blockchain. I can give an example. The Rohingya uh, community are refugees uh, in Bangladesh and Myanmar in that region. There was an initiative that uh, tried to argue that the Rohingyas should have virtual identities that will uh, help them no matter where they are. And there was a project launched. But there was a severe objection from privacy activists who said once you put information on the blockchain, it becomes permanent. There's no way. In fact, GDPR has a direct conflict with uh, the blockchain. The right to be forgotten is at conflict with the blockchain because once you put something online, you cannot remove it. So the present practice is not to put any personal information on the blockchain. That's at the basic business level, not even the scalability and the cost. Now, when you come up the, uh, the, the, the pyramid and you have issues of scalability, it's a major problem. All solutions, none of them compare with the, the, the scalability and the throughput of uh, traditional systems like the Visa credit card system. So the number of transactions, if it goes up, you have a problem, you have a bottleneck. The cost is a huge issue, uh, and of course it depends. Currently you have Ethereum, which is a global, kind of one single global computer. You also can have private blockchains or semi-private, uh, like uh, Hyperledger, there are multiple products there. Now, uh, there are also situations where the cost can be contained by a community. Suppose there's a cooperative of fishermen who want to do a financial inclusion software. Actually, they can uh, run a private blockchain. They don't want to, they don't have to go to Ethereum. Now, there is a, this is a huge uh, debate issue that some people say Hyperledger Fabric is not a blockchain. Others argue that it is pretty much because IBM has just launched a food safety network only for food safety, uh, the traceability of foods. And they are providing that as a kind of solution for, a generic solution for any blockchain-based food kind of issues. So at this point, uh, there are very severe limitations. And in fact, there are some very good uh, you know, flowcharts that tell you, do you want to check whether your project requires a blockchain? You go, go on this. It's available online. And it asks you several questions. And then mostly it says you don't need the blockchain. So blockchain is fundamentally required when there are multiple parties who are forced to trust each other. They don't know each other. They're forced to trust. And the blockchain takes out the trust angle. If you make a blockchain out of paper and stick it on the wall, that is still immutable. You have sheets of uh, paper on the wall. It is still immutable because of the cryptography uh, that was mentioned. So it's not an easy question to answer. There are so many considerations that you have to take into account. Uh, and uh, by no means would I recommend blockchain for everything. Thank you. We have slightly more than 10 minutes and maybe time for one or two more questions from the audience if, or another intervention. Please. Could I, could I interject Absolutely. here a Absolutely. little bit? Because you know, Bitcoin's proof of work algorithm and the energy that is consumed is used as the poster child for, for how bad the technology is. Uh, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist in a sense. Um, and I would argue compared to what? You know, Bitcoin is coming up to its 10th year anniversary, and now we have a, a mechanism by which, I don't know how many exahashes there are right now, but we can now route value over the network um, without an intermediary for the very first time. And there have been many clones, but Bitcoin was the original one. Where we are with the technology right now is that we recognize that these, or again, speaking personally, I call the internet was a stupid network, right? We took out the intelligent, and we now put sort of all the devices, the intelligence outside of the network into these edge devices, which have changed from desktops, laptops, to now the mobile phone. I look at these blockchain networks as slow networks. 
And normally being slow and stupid is not a good recipe for, for success. But this is a kind of a very interesting technology where once you, once you have something which is internally consistent, no one can change. There have been estimates that if you took the total energy of the sun and you tried to break some of the hash rate, you would probably, you know, it would be half the age of the universe. So the question is in terms of energy consumption as compared to what, number one. Number two is that with these protocols right now, um, at Scaling Bitcoin 2, we, there was a proposal called Segregated Witness, which managed to layer the Bitcoin protocol. And so we now talk about layer two, and there's a protocol called Lightning, and, and now sort of the elements of a standard f called the basis of Lightning technology. So On-chain, these networks are very slow. We've gone from three to seven transactions per second to something like seven to 14 transactions per second, almost double, right? Whoopee, Visa on a good day is 70,000. Right? So on-chain transactions are very, very costly. But now on level two, layer two, I think the current estimates are that we can go on layer two to about six million transactions per second. I'll repeat that. Layer two, not on-chain, but off-chain, we can, in theory, go to six million transactions per second. Again, certain number of transactions per, per, per channel, you add up the channels, you get through a throughput which you actually cannot do with centralized systems. And so the reason why I think this is a breakthrough technology is that there are things that you can't, can't do, again, crossing trust borders anywhere on the network is what Bitcoin enabled us to do. We're beginning to, again, address the scalability issues. We're beginning to, I don't think we'll ever necessarily address the energy issues, right? The energy is a lot, but it's, it's fair to everyone because again, it's outside the, it's, it's beyond, it's so great right now. I don't know how many exahashes it is, is that it's beyond any individual actor to break. And that's something that we've not seen before. So I question the, the challenge of energy because it's not clear to me compared to what. Thank you. Just to note, I looked up the uh, current uh, hash rate. It's 50 million uh, tera hashes per second. So that's uh, quite a lot. <laughs> um, but to come back to the question about the constitution, I kept that in mind, <laughs> not to forget. Uh, civil is eventually a human-built system. It, it relies on humans to add con uh, add. Uh, rules and regulations. So like, like the Bitcoin itself was built by humans even initially. So the idea was we built the system like this first wallet and core, uh, Bitcoin core group built the uh, initial rules and the 21 million limit, for example. And once it's self-sustaining, then we should not alter it except for the same rules that apply in the case of uh, vetting or challenging a newsroom, which would be changing the constitution using a vote mechanism. That brings us again to the concept of assumption that people will be good. People will be, uh, uh, we always have the optimistic view that uh, no danger will come up to the network. But again, some people would see that as a naive form of the belief. And uh, it's up to the community to, uh, you know, prove us wrong, and prove everyone wrong. All right, any, anyone else, any comment? Any speaker wanna wrap up on, on anything? Any other example? Hinata, please, is there, is there a remote participation? Uh, actually, I just wanted to uh, bring up um, in Internet Freedom Festival, uh, the blockchain special interest group received some of the uh, concerns and questions that were voiced here. Uh, we have a report published on specifically on the idea of um, anonymization and, uh, and uh, uh, identity in blockchain era. Um, as just like many other technologies online, there are those who uh, believe that it's important that for some transactions uh, you need to have uh, a safe haven. But uh, of course uh, the, the idea of identity and anonymization on blockchain goes beyond uh, the, the infrastructure of the technology itself. As it was said here so many times, there are many vulnerable groups that are having projects developed like indigenous refugees and so there are a number of factors that go beyond the technology
Thank you very much, Renata. And with that, I would like to wrap up the session, thanking you all very much, thanking the speakers. The idea here in the in this, for as much as is it is hard for everyone to fly over to Paris and, 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 and attend the session on something which arises, the amount of interest that I, I imagine has been arising in, in your places. Uh, five or six minutes of every presentation might not be uh, enough, but the idea here was to bring specifically, as I said, uses and applications of blockchain tech or potential uses and applications of, of blockchain technologies that are a, a little bit apart from the mere crypto active scenario. And I think we, we managed to, to showcase a couple of those scenarios. Uh, the ones specifically using uh, identity, universal identification, humanitarian action, social uh, applications, and all of this, even with the high concern of the externality factor that was pointed out here. I believe it's something for us to, to keep an eye on and keep working. Thank you very much for your presence here and have a nice day. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Everyone, just a quick announcement. Uh, from the IGF 2018, there are some workshops that are small, so that's why you can get in the room. It gets full capacity very quickly. But you can always watch online. Uh, there are overflow rooms, sometimes empty here. And uh, the main session, room one, has a, full, has a lot of seats. So it will be a chance that everybody can have space there. Thank you.